uh, it's a very common side effect of uh, levodopa treatment. Uh, we say usually it's about 40% of patients after four years of treatment of levodopa. Uh, the point is that in most of the cases, especially nowadays, it's not so disabling for patients, especially when these kinesia are mild or moderate. But in a few cases, it can be very severe and disabling, can uh, disable patients for dressing, writing, or walking. They could have uh, balance difficulties. So it can be uh, uh, still a difficult problem to manage in patients. What we know is that when we replace dopamine in Parkinson's disease patient, in fact, we are not replacing dopamine in a uh, physiological way. And probably, especially because of the pulsatility of dopamine uh, restoration, we induce an abnormal plasticity at the level of the striatum. And the striatum is a complicated structure. She receives some uh, afferents from the cortical striatal pathway that are uh, glutamate pathway. Uh, and we know that because of this pulsatility of dopamine restoration, this uh, glutamate pathway is hyperactive. But we know also at the level of the striatum that there is the serotonin is important and serotonin modulates the dopamine transmission. And it's why uh, especially the 5-HT1 receptor of serotonin is probably involved in the uh, inducing uh, for, uh, dyskinesia. Uh, but also some uh, over neurotransmitter, I think cholinergic uh, transmission, uh, opioid receptor, cannabinoid receptors are involved in. So the pathophysiology is a little bit complicated and still not well known. Uh, the only practical consequence is at the level of the glutamatergic abnormalities because we can use some drugs uh, decreasing a little bit this hyperglutamatergic uh, stimulation to the striatum, and it is uh, done with uh, amantadine, which is a drug marketed for that in Parkinson's disease. This uh, change comes from uh, uh, experimental evidence in a rodent's model of Parkinson's disease. It has recently been observed, this change in the dendritic spines, and uh, it's maybe linked to the, to the process inducing dyskinesia. So even if it's just observed in rodents right now, it's an interesting uh, findings because maybe we could play on this abnormal plasticity. Uh, some uh, re calcium channel seems to be involved in this enlargement of uh, dendritic spine. So it may be a way of treating dyskinesia in the future. I, I think the most important advance for me is the way we, we, we treat the patient now. I remember 30 years ago when I was a resident in neurology, uh, seeing patients with very, very severe dyskinesia. And uh, such a patient I never observe now. And uh, it's not because we have uh, new drugs, but it's just the way we treat the patient. 30 years ago, we start our treatment with a high dosage of levodopa. Now we are uh, much more precise in the fine tuning for dopamine restoration. We try to use dopamine agonists if feasible. We try to use uh, uh, levodopa uh, at the lowest dosage that the patient needs. And really the treatment is highly individualized and it's probably explaining why we are not, uh, we are better to treat our patient and we are inducing less severe dyskinesia than before. So the first key uh, message is that the pathophysiology is very complicated and we still don't know so much about that. Uh, the second message is that from a practical point of view, the only drug available to decrease dyskinesia is amantadine. And my third message is that uh, uh, having a fine tuning of uh, dopamine restoration clearly helps to reduce the occurrence of severe dyskinesia. So it's very important to treat the patient in a way to prevent the uh, occurrence of dyskinesia.